Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give everybody just a minute to join in and then we'll get started. Still a few people joining in, so we'll wait just another minute. So I'll mention just a couple of things as people are still joining. Um, one is that Leanne and I are going to be presenting together today. And so um, we'll be kind of taking turns sharing the screen and then taking our masks on and off and socially distancing. So thanks so much for your patience during those transitions. Um, there will be um, an opportunity to ask questions during the session today. The chat function is not um, active, but you can ask questions in the Q&A. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that little icon for the Q&A and you can enter questions there. Um, we have some panelists with us today that will be answering questions um, just in that chat. Um, but if we have time at the end, Leanne and I will also ask some questions live. If we don't get to all of the questions, then we'll make sure to send out um, an FAQ document um, to the community so you can see the answers. Um, and I think that's it. This session will be recorded. So um, just know that you don't have to take notes as you're going. If you want to go back and rewatch, you're welcome to do that later. So I think we'll jump in and get started. My name is Molly Ball, and I'm the elementary literacy coach here at Stanford. Um, this is my third year at SAIS and I taught grade three for the last two years. So you might recognize me from teaching in that grade level. Prior to that, I was in Korea and I taught across the grades K to five there. Um, and then before that, I was in the United States, which is my home country. So I'll pass you to Leanne and she's going to introduce herself. Hi, <laughs> uh, my name is Leanne and I am the elementary mathematics coach here at Stanford. So I work with teachers and children from grades one through to grades five. Um, like Molly, I have been here for three years as well. Um, I was in the ELV last year in KG2 and I really was really excited to join the curriculum team and work with mathematics. Previous to Stanford, my husband and my two boys and I were in the United Arab Emirates and prior to that, we've been working in the United Kingdom, Spain, and my home country is New Zealand. So that's a little bit about us. Um, today, we are going to focus mainly on the language arts and with Molly and the mathematics with myself. But we do want to just start off by talking about where that fits within the PYP framework. So we are an IB school, International Baccalaureate School. And in the elementary school, we have the PYP framework, which is the primary years program. Michael Hughes, our PYP coordinator, um, put out a video explaining more about the PYP framework earlier. So if you're interested and you want some more information about that, uh, do reach out and rewatch that video. Um, but the PYP program has a lot of elements to it. Today, Molly and I will just be focusing on the language arts and math and the what we teach and the standards that fit within that. 
Um, and we'll also be looking at the approaches to teaching or how we teach that. So I am going to pass you back to the wonderful Molly and she is going to share with you today some information about what language arts in the elementary school at Stanford looks like. Thanks, Leanne. So we're going to look at language arts um, and we'll be digging into what we teach in our language arts program and how we teach language arts at Stanford. So here at Stanford, we use the ARO standards, which stands for American Education Reaches Out. And these standards tell the teachers what we teach. Um, and they're structured um, like this for language arts. So this is kind of how they're organized. We have um, the different strands, so reading, writing, listening and speaking, and language on foundations. And then within each of those domains, um, there are different skills and benchmarks that students would be working towards. Um, and those would be specific to the grade level that the students are in. So here's an example of a standard that students might um, be working towards in reading. So this one is determining central ideas or themes of a text, analyzing development, summarizing and supporting details. So you can see starting in kindergarten what that looks like and how it kind of increases in complexity and the depth of knowledge um, throughout the grades. So we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about how we approach teaching language arts. Um, we are a PYP school, as Leanne said, and sometimes the PYP approach can look a little bit different than other curriculums or, um, you know, sometimes what we're familiar with with our own schooling. So I'm going to give you just a minute to kind of look at some of these differences that you might expect to see, and then I'll talk about just a couple of them together. So one difference that I wanted to highlight um, is this one where we talk about using skill and drill texts and workbooks to learn language arts skills. Um, in a more traditional curriculum, you might see students with like a grammar workbook or um, you know comprehension worksheets that go with a text leveled set or something like that. Um, in a PYP school um, at Stanford, we use a balanced literacy approach. And I'm gonna talk in more detail about that in a little bit, um, but we really are trying to get kids not to learn those skills in isolation, but to transfer and practice those skills in all areas of literacy. Another example, um, and this is one that parents ask about a lot, is spelling. And so in a traditional curriculum, you might see um, spelling taught in isolation or for the sake of just, um, like kind of memorizing how words are put together and what would make sense in spelling them. In a PYP school and here at Stanford, we are approaching that in a way where we're transferring word work into daily reading and writing that students are doing. Um, so we're investigating language in a way where students are really exploring like how spelling can impact meaning in text and why we would want to know more about that as readers and writers. Okay. Okay, so we are a PYP school, so we use the PYP language scope and sequence um, to guide our approaches to teaching. Um, and one thing that I wanted to highlight here is that it's really important that we are engaging students in learning within meaningful contexts. So we do have those skills um, and that knowledge that we want students to gain, and that comes from those ARO standards. Um, but we don't do those things in isolation. Um, we're really thinking about giving students multiple opportunities to transfer those skills into context and to be thinking about what that would look like beyond school um, in the real world. So I had mentioned the approach of balanced literacy, which is what we use here at Stanford um, to approach our literacy instruction. And these are the key components of balanced literacy. So we would have reading and writing workshop, read alouds with accountable talk, word study, which includes that spelling, high frequency words, phonics, grammar, vocabulary, um, shared reading, host country literacy, interactive and shared writing, and guided reading. And these are all kind of powerful in their own way, but in a classroom, you might not see these things as like separate areas of instruction. A lot of them can kind of live within each other. 
Um, one approach that we use and a structure that we use is workshop. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that structure in just a minute, but it's important to note that all of these other things we can see within that framework, we can see within that model. Um, so students are constantly kind of dipping in and out of these things, these different opportunities to explore literacy in meaningful ways. So these are just some of the reasons why we have chosen a balanced literacy approach here at Stanford. Um, one of the most important things for our students being at a PYP school is that they have opportunities to apply their learning, that they have that voice, choice, and ownership on their own learning path. Um, but also our approach allows like for this building of community and um, allows for teachers and students to build relationships, to support each other, to take risks. Um, for teachers, it really gives us an opportunity to target and individualize our instruction to find out what kids need next and then to give them kind of that next thing. Um, and ultimately it helps to foster lifelong readers and writers, which is our goal here. So this is the structure of workshop. Um, you would see some key components um, anytime you walk into a workshop classroom. So we would always have this mini lesson to kind of start the lesson, Oops. and then we would have this work time in the middle um, where students are trying new strategies, um, exploring concepts, applying skills. Teachers would then be working with students to do that work. And then at the end of a workshop block, there's always an opportunity to share. So I'm gonna talk through each part individually, and then I'll show you some examples of what this might look like in the classroom and what your students might be um, doing in these different parts of a workshop lesson. Um, so the first part is the mini lesson, and this would be on a focused um, topic, and that could be reading, it could be writing, it could be word work, could you have a grammar focus, it might be a shared text, um, but the teacher would determine the focus based on those benchmarks, those standards that we know from Arrow, um, and also what they, they see that students need. So we're constantly using data and using what students are currently doing to kind of think about what we would give them next. Here are some examples of um, what a mini lesson could look like in the classroom. So in this example here, um, these students in grade one actually had a phonics focus. So they were doing some investigation of words, um, exploring that double O sound, like what sounds could that make in words? Um, and they would have an opportunity in the mini lesson to kind of learn about that, explore that together as a group guided by the teacher, and then have some time to actively engage in it before going off and trying it on their own. Another example is this one over here of a student um, leading kind of a shared reading in the class. Um, this class, which is also grade one, they were looking at a text across the week um, and practicing things like fluency and accuracy, um, grammar and conventions, punctuation, comprehension, and coming together in that mini lesson to kind of practice those things as a group. And then the example in the middle at the bottom is a grade three class. They were working on um, exploring graphic novels. So they were in kind of inquiring into what they can learn about these types of texts that they might put in their own writing pieces. And then they had some time to kind of discuss and share out about that before applying it on their own. So the next part of workshop is this work time. And this would take up the bulk of the time um, in a workshop classroom. And students during this time would be doing the work. Um, they would be reading independently or with a partner. They would be working on their writing pieces. They might be doing some word explorations. Um, we really want to give students opportunities to try and practice and explore those different skills that um, we're teaching them. The teachers during this time would be conferring, meeting on, in one-on-one -on -one conferences with students, um, coaching into things that they're noticing, giving them that next thing. Um, this is where teachers are really having the opportunity to give that individualized targeted feedback. Um, you might also see teachers working with small groups. If they identify that students have similar needs, they might um, pull a small group together to kind of feed off of each other and work through that as a team. So sometimes during that work block, um, students are working with partners. 
Um, they might be sharing together um, things that they're doing, using a checklist, setting goals, and kind of coaching into each other's work. You might see students reading alongside each other, practicing things like fluency or accuracy. Um, you know, the, the girls at the top in the corner, they're kind of like practicing sequencing and retelling. Um, so they might do that together with a partner to practice first before going off and trying that on their own. You might also see in that work block some time for independent work. Um, we really want to be giving students opportunities to try this on their own and build up that independence. So you might see students working on their writing pieces, um, reading independently and practicing strategies that they've gained or skills that they've learned. Um, on the bottom, you can see that the student is doing some individual word exploration um, and kind of just inquiring into what she knows about language independently. And then you would have time where teachers are meeting one-on-one -on -one with students. Um, the purpose of these conferences is for teachers to gather data and information on what students are doing because that would inform what they would give them next. Um, it's an opportunity to build relationships with our readers and writers um, and to really just um, spend time together exploring things that students are trying, celebrating successes that they're having, um, and kind of nudging them in the next direction with that next thing. And then during the work time, you might also see some small group work. So small groups would come together um, to explore as a team. Um, students can feed off of each other. The teacher can kind of guide that instruction. And these would be on an identified need that the student said, oh, the teacher kind of noticed like these students all have this in common and kind of work through this together. So I might pull that team to work on that as a group. Um, you might also see students working together um, just in bigger numbers, kind of like partner work, but um, elevated just a little bit where you have groups discussing and sharing ideas and kind of building off of each other. And then at the end of a workshop, there's always that opportunity to share. Um, this is where we really build that community and build those relationships and give students the opportunity to celebrate things that they're doing. Um, sometimes this is where we see the most um, excitement around things that students are trying out independently or with a partner. Um, kids love to share where they are in their learning process and kind of reflect on those things before moving on to the next step. This can look um, very different too, depending on what, what the students are working on, what the focus is, um, and what the, the teacher might wanna see at the end of that. So sometimes it could be a whole group share. On the bottom, you can see this is a grade three class. They had just finished a poetry unit and they were practicing their fluency of reading poems out loud. So they kind of did like a whole class share on um, having the opportunity to share what they had practiced in a group. Um, sometimes you'll see pairs of group, groups of students and partners sharing, um, you know, talking about what they did that day, maybe goal setting, using a checklist to kind of guide some of those learning outcomes that um, they're working towards. This example of the word work, the rhyming words up here, that's an example of what students shared on Seesaw. So sometimes the purpose of sharing is to share what's going on at home. Um, you know, it might be sharing for the purpose of the teacher kind of assessing where the students are and what they understand to plan for next steps. On the bottom, you can see a grade two example of students sharing on a Padlet. They were doing some explorations in language and studying some grammar features, and they spent their work time kind of building sentences and then had the opportunity at the end of the block to share with their classmates. So I wanted to speak a little bit deeper to word study and the components that are within what we would consider word study because this is a question that we get a lot from parents. Um, so when we speak about word study, we're talking about these key things. So phonological awareness, phonics and spelling, vocabulary, and grammar and conventions. Um, so you may have noticed, I kind of highlighted a couple of examples as I was talking through workshop and our approach with balanced literacy, but these things all kind of live within that structure too. Um, teachers would be kind of highlighting areas where we could dig into this work and investigate language. And then we would be focusing on what that means for us as readers and writers, that transfer and always in context. 
these are just some examples of what that could look like in the classroom. So you can see students here are working on some high frequency words with some active engagements. Um, a grade three class here was investigating new words that came up in one of the read aloud books. So one of the words was scruffiest and they were kind of going around the room and working with their classmates to figure out like, what could that mean? Um, this is an example of a whole class exploration in phonics, um, investigating why are vowels important and the grade one students were kind of trying to figure out like, how could we analyze this? Why does this matter? And then they would try to come to some conclusions that they could apply into their own reading and writing. On the bottom, you can see a grade five example. Um, students here were deconstructing words and trying to like build new words based on what they knew um, about the history of words and how we put together language and how words work and what that can tell us about what they mean. Here are just a few more examples. In the middle here, you can see this is a mini lesson. This was some interactive editing. So as a class, they were kind of digging into some grammar and conventions. And then they had the opportunity during their work time to go off and try it with a partner and apply it to their own writing. Um, you might also see students doing some word work in small groups, if that's an identified need. Um, the teacher might be guiding students to explore language in that way. Um, this is an example here of a one on one conference and a teacher and a student were looking at an individual writing piece and they were kind of helping the student to transfer like we learned this here and we explored this as a class how can we remember to do that in our own writing so all of those word study components are kind of within the same structure too and we're constantly thinking about opportunities that we can give students to kind of lift up what they know and to add meaning to that as readers and writers So here at Stanford, um, we're really focused on our approach to literacy instruction um, in pursuit of empowering students to become, you know, articulate readers and writers. We want them to be able to read and write well. We want them to love to read and write, and we want them to take those skills and strategies um, into their, you know, lifelong approach to reading and writing. So I will pass you back to Leanne now, and she's going to talk to you about kind of the what and the how of mathematics. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> um, so we are going to spend a little bit of time now exploring mathematics here at Stanford and what that is and how that what that looks like in the classroom. So similar to Molly, um, I'm going to be focused on the what we teach, but I'll probably spend more time delving into how we teach this here at Stanford. Just as with language arts, we also have the ERO standards. Now these are organized a little bit different when it comes to mathematics. So in mathematics, we have these content domains and they stretch right, oops, they stretch right from grade one all the way through to grade five but they, come, they build on each other and they become more complex as you go throughout the grade levels. For example, in this domain, the numbers in base 10, some of the standards have to do with counting or decomposing numbers into two digits. Whereas by the time they leave us potentially in grade five, they may be working with multi-digit numbers and they would be starting to explore decimals and the relationship between whole numbers and decimals. There is one domain that only starts in grade three. This is the numbers and operations with fractions domain. Um, this goes from grade three through to grade five and beyond into grade six as well. This does not mean that they don't do fractions in, in earlier grades. They look at fractions of a shape in grade one and grade two, but it's really in grade three where we start to delve into the fractions as it comes to numbers. Now sitting along these content standards, we also have a series of mathematical practices. So our practices. These are a series of eight practices that follow the children on their journey throughout their time here at Stanford. And if you had watched Michael Hughes' presentation on the PYP, you may make some links to the ATLs, those communication skills, research skills, thinking skills. Those grow and follow and become more complex as the children follow their journey throughout Stanford. It's the similar thing with the mathematical practices. So these are a series of skills that become and the children delve into as they go throughout their journey in maths. For example, if a grade two was looking at addition, potentially there would be a focus on them being able to precisely communicate their ideas and their thinking. 
Or maybe we would be asking them to model their addition with lots of different manipulatives and different visual techniques. Potentially, we could be asking them and focusing in on how they are sharing and critiquing the strategies of their friends or their peers. So these practices sit alongside the content standards to provide the rigor and to provide the overview for their journey here at Stanford and the mathematics. What I'm going to spend some more time talking on now is that how we teach mathematics. And once again, just like in the language arts, we have the PYP framework to support us with this. Um, I'm going to give you a minute or so just to read through these, and then I'm going to pick out a couple um, that I'd like to talk to in a bit more depth. That was a very quick minute, <laughs> but we will, we will move on. Um, so the first one I really want to outline is potentially in a more traditional curriculum or in other schools with curriculums, you may have noticed that there was an answer on, uh, there was an emphasis on just getting that one answer and probably getting it quite quickly. And mathematics was all about getting that one answer really quickly and perhaps you had one method in your tool belt. The PYP approach encourages a variety of strategies, and we're going to be delving into this later on in the webinar, but we really have, we still have an emphasis on getting the correct answer. That's still really important as mathematicians. We want to be, make sure that we are correct, but there's also a dual emphasis on that process. We want to encourage our mathematicians to be elegant and efficient problem solvers. And in order to do that, they need to have a choice and voice and agency in the tools and the strategies they're using in order to get to the answer. So that may be one difference that I'll try and explore in a bit more detail. One of the other detail, um, details that may be different is perhaps in other schools or in your own experience as math as a child, um, you had a guidebook or a workbook or a textbook and you kind of worked your way through from chapter one all the way through to the end. We, the PYP has a dynamic approach and it's really responsive to student needs. So we don't have just one textbook or one workbook. We have a variety of resources that we use to support the children in their learning. Sometimes this could be a textbook, but sometimes this could be an internet um, website or sometimes it might be an app. Sometimes it might be talking and having conversation with groups. So we use a variety of tools in the classroom that help really um, target and identify student needs. This quote is taken from our PYP Math Scope and Sequence, um, and it kind of serves to illustrate that point even further. The mathematicians that walk into our classrooms have their own bank of knowledge and their own experiences with maths. So we want to try and build on that and use that prior knowledge to help construct their own meaning and start to push them to that next level. We really want to work on here at Stanford, developing children's conceptual understandings. Do they actually understand what they're doing? Can they articulate that? Where are they ready to move to next? The other point I want to, to bring about is that it's really important with the PYP framework is that we're not just teaching maths in isolation, similar to what Molly was talking about with the language arts. Maths doesn't just belong within the walls of our school. Maths is a way of talking about and explaining the world around us. Children need to be able to be confident in bringing the maths from the classroom into their everyday lives. So here at Stanford, we ensure that we are constantly drawing parallels between the two and that we are teaching maths in relevant, realistic contexts that filter in between the classroom walls and the outside world. This diagram I'm going to spend a little bit of more time explaining over the next 10 minutes or so. And it talks about the development of how children learn mathematics. So I'm going to be going into each of these stages, the constructing meaning, the transferring meaning, and the applying with understanding. And while I'm going to be talking about these stages in quite a linear fashion, it kind of is, is really cyclic. And we might be targeting different stage of this inquiry, this process, depending on where the children are at. But for ease, I will go through them one by one. 
So the first stage in this cycle is that constructing meaning. This is building children's understanding of that, that conceptual understanding. Do they really understand the concepts that we're trying to teach? In this stage, children might be describing things or demonstrating. We might be asking them to model us or to show. They might be measuring or using. In the classroom, you might see more manipulatives come out. They might be using visual strategies to model their thinking. Maths also comes with its own series of very technical words. So we might be delving into that and begin to identify and define some of these mathematical, new mathematical vocabulary. What would this look like? This is a grade one class and you can see they're using manipulatives to explore the concept of place value. What does it mean that a number has tens and ones? How can we show this? Um, we use a variety of manipulatives so they don't become just reliant on one and they can draw parallels between different ways of thinking. But we don't just use manipulatives in the lower elementary school, we use them right throughout. This is a grade three example and they were exploring the concept of perimeter. Um, they used a variety of equipment from around the room to explore the perimeter of this A3 piece of paper and when they collated their results they found out they all had different answers. So this then started an investigation and a conversation about why we have to use standard units of measurement when we want to measure the perimeter of a shape. This is a grade four example. The child over here was starting to build their understanding of what happens when you multiply fractions by a whole number. And these blocks help them to illustrate exactly what happens. Now we don't want the children to stay within this stage. We use the manipulatives to help build their understanding, and then we want to shift them from that. So that next stage is being able to model their thinking, maybe using some different models. This is a grade four student, and they are beginning to investigate multiplication, and they were solving 99 times 86, and they really pulled apart the place value of numbers. So they're using a box model, box model to help them with their thinking. This example here shows how the student used the visual tool of a number line to help them solve some problems in grade three. Uh, this is an upper elementary child who used a ratio table to solve 624 divided by 12. The strategy they were using was multiplying up. Um, so they've used a ratio table to help organize their thinking. And they've been quite efficient here. You can see that they was started to go up double, double, double. When they got to here, they said, oh, I can do this quicker. So 10, I know 10 lots of 12 is 120, times that by five, 50 lots of 12, that's 600. Oh, I only need two more groups of 12. So the answer must be 52. We introduce these visual models and these visual tools right from when they start in grade one. This is a grade one example of starting to use a number line and exploring which way does it go when we add and subtract. And they were using the B-Bot to help them with that. I talked about that in that constructing meaning phase, there's a lot of mathematical terms that need to be explored. This is a grade five example. And the teacher had posted some different definitions around the class. And then the children in small groups or individually went around with a checklist and tried to match the shapes to the definitions in order to really unpack what those definitions mean. This perhaps is a slightly different approach from standing at the front of the classroom and saying, this is a parallelogram, this is a rhombus, this is a trapezoid. It really encouraged the children to form their own conceptual understandings on what these words mean. These conversations happen all of the time in our mathematics classrooms here at Stanford. And we try and anchor these onto specific charts. So these are called anchor charts. And well, you can't come in at the moment, but when you do come in, you might be able to see anchor charts in some classrooms. And this is where we really capture the learning that's taken place during that lesson and perhaps delve into some of these words and we have them around the room. So all of that is involved with that constructing meaning stage. If they've understood the concept and they know what it means, we really want to nudge them to that next stage, which is that transferring meaning. So we want them to be become a little bit more efficient. We want them to be able to communicate their ideas with greater accuracy. 
We're also going to develop their ability to write those equations and to develop some fluency with their thinking. Within this stage, you might see children explaining, calculating, solving, interpreting, comparing, proving, and collecting. And here are some examples of this. This is an upper elementary example where two children were solving a division using an equation, and then they were comparing their answers to see how they did. This is a lower elementary example from grade one. They'd finished their investigation using the manipulatives. Now they were trying to explore the place value of numbers by writing equations. And you can see this child has done that in two different ways, which is great. Now writing equations does not necessarily mean all the time just using the algorithm. So I want to explore that a little bit more. So this is an example from grade two. The teacher posed this question on Seesaw. And this is some of the thinking that she got back. This child solved that question um, by using those base 10 blocks to help her. And then she, write, she wrote the answer to the question. So you can see she's still in between that constructing meaning and that transferring stage. This child solved the question by thinking about the place value of the numbers. So she took the 20 and the 10 to make 30 and the five and the seven to make 12. And then she came up with her answer of 42. This child used a similar strategy, but perhaps wrote it in a more recognizable mathematical way. This child used a different strategy. She took the 17, um, broke it apart to make a friendly number of 30, and then added the remainder on to get the 42. This child used that traditional algorithm. And this child, he wanted to add up in chunks. So he said, well, 25 and 10 is the 35, and then seven more is the 42. They all got the right answer, they all wrote equations, but it really serves to illustrate what they were thinking and the strategy they were using in order to get that answer. Then that teacher could have the conversation with the class or with individual childs to really target in, are we being as efficient as we could? What other way could we try and solve that problem? Um, and within this stage, we do want the children to develop that fluency. So they're starting to have more automaticity. They're starting to be a little bit quicker with how they calculate or solve problems. And one way we can do this in the classroom is to put it into a game situation. So this is a grade five example of using a decimal and ordering decimals in a game. Uh, this was a really fun challenge for grade four where they were trying to make the largest multi-digit number. This is an example of a grade three game. Um, where they understood the concept of area and now they were starting to, to build on that and gather some fluency and momentum in doing that a little bit faster. Your turn. <laughs> um, so I've got a problem there, 19 times five, and I'd like you to have a think about the answer. Please don't use your phone or the calculator on your phone. And I'd like to do a little bit of talking about how the numbers can sometimes dictate the strategy. So have a go. Got your answer? Some of you may have tried this. So some of you may have broken the 19 up into 10 and nine, and then added your answer to, back to get the 95. Maybe some of you rounded to a friendly number and then took away a group of five. Perhaps some of you used the traditional algorithm. If this was a classroom situation here at Stanford, we would then discuss, um, which of these do we think is the most efficient? Which, which of these strategies would you like to try next? Which of these strategies works the best for this series of numbers? The next day we might try something different. Have a go at solving this one. Have you got it? <laughs> so potentially some of you may have used the strategies that we talked about on the previous slide. You might have used the place value of the number. Maybe you used a friendly number and rounded up. Well, maybe these numbers let us use a different strategy. This is a strategy called doubling and halving, where you double one factor and half the other until you come to a more manageable multiplication question for you to answer. Maybe you split the factors up and you did 18 times eight times two. If this was a student in our class, we might talk about how we can write that in a more mathematical way. And it look, might look something like this. Then we would have that conversation about so different numbers lend themselves towards different strategies. Why is it important that they have all of these strategies? 
Well, we want children to be efficient and we want children to have as many tools in their toolbox to answer those questions so that when they get to higher numbers, they have enough strategies to be able to answer and efficiently and elegantly. So for example, if we had this one, which I'm not going to ask you to solve today, um, maybe the children would say, well, could we use place value? Maybe we could double in half. Potentially we could use friendly numbers. Could we use the algorithm here? Or maybe it's best to split the factors. So when we talk about being efficient problem solvers, we're talking about the children having choice with strategies and choosing the one that is the most efficient. This final stage is that applying with understanding. So this is what I referenced at the beginning, is are we taking the mathematics from the classroom and putting it into the real world? With this stage, you might see children comparing, discussing, they might be justifying or predicting, they might be presenting information to others. Some examples of this, this is a grade five example. They took a real, wide, real world problem and they all explored how to solve it in different ways and shared their answers. This is a grade three example. This was just before Christmas and they were looking at Christmas presents and they drew out on the, the concrete outside with chalk different presents and how much wrapping paper would they need? So they had to apply their understanding of area and perimeter in order to answer questions that have been posed by other people in the group. This is a grade five example. Those are clearly not grade five students, um, but they had to estimate how many donuts they thought were in that box. We gave them a bit more information. And then as a group, they worked out some answers and we had a really great discussion about, so which strategy would be the most efficient for solving that? And we eventually got to where we'd solved it within four steps. So the conversation was about which strategy they were using, which is the most efficient, and then being able to check our answers. Another element of this stage is that ability to teach others, either teach others in the community and teach people at home or teach other children in our class or in our grade level. This is an example in grade three um, where the teacher had set up a Padlet and the children were sharing their ideas and learning from each other new techniques and new ways and new strategies. They also had it set up as a resource so that they could refer to it, much like an anchor chart where we talked about earlier. This is a lower elementary example, and these students are teaching each other the strategy that they use for addition. Um, these children are using a number line and show how they can add up using a number line. These children are using tens frames and breaking numbers apart. So eight and two make 10 and then another three is what? These children are using the counters and counting on. So they're having to teach others and share their knowledge about how to use different strategies. So um, I've spent a lot of time today talking about how children learn mathematics. And I did mention that even though I've gone through them one by one with the constructing or that modeling phase and then the transferring or the solving and then the applying or the teaching phase, we do not necessarily teach them or go, the children do not necessarily go through the stages in that order. We might have some children that are really great here, but just need some kind of parallels or some alignments of how that works and do they understand what they're actually doing? Or are they just working through a series of steps? Um, so I hope that's been helpful. Um, I'm going to pass you back to the wonderful Molly. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit more information about, so how does all this relate to my child and where can I find information about what my child is learning? Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of talk through and show you where you can find information about what your child is currently learning. Um, so we'll look at where we can find that information on Seesaw and also on my Stanford. Um, you will have been receiving messages from Michael Hughes and Michael Hughes is our PYP coordinator. Um, so if you weren't sure who that was, that's who that is. <laughs> Um, if you get a notification from him, you can go into your inbox and then to your messages and there'll be a message in there um, with what we would refer to as curriculum overviews. Um, those curriculum overviews will show you um, in the unit of inquiry 
in mathematics, in reading and writing, um, those concepts and skills that your students are currently learning. On my Stanford, you can also access those. So if you go into the elementary school and then to curriculum, you can find the elementary curriculum overviews there. And then you just have to click on the one for your child's grade level. So here's the grade one quarter two overview, grade four. And you can also find the quarter three, which is current. So right now you could go in and look um, what those areas of focus are across the disciplines. This is an example of what those overviews might look like. Um, so you can see the unit of inquiry, mathematics, reading and writing. And then these um, areas here, these are clickable links. So if you wanted to have more um, detailed learning outcomes and access to the specific skills that students are learning within that big theme or within that big concept, you could click there for some student checklists. Um, and you'd also um, see those on Seesaw too. These are just a couple of examples of what those checklists could look like. So in mathematics, we have kind of those different stages. So that construct is the model, that transfer is the solve, and then the teach is that apply. So students would be interacting with checks checklists like this in class, um, but you could also view those on the overviews too. Okay, so we are going to, we have a little bit of time, so we'll take just a couple of questions um, to wrap up our time together. We probably won't get to all of them. So if your question doesn't get answered, then um, we'll make sure to send out an FAQ to answer all of those questions. Or just this one, just one. Okay, so there's just one. Um, and it was in regards to word study. Um, one of you had asked how you can help at home. So when we're thinking about those components of word study, so like phonics and spelling, vocabulary, and then grammar and conventions. Um, so I would encourage you to do what our teachers do here. And that's to investigate and inquire into some of those things together. Um, we're not using like one standard resource, one standard tool or program. We use a lot of different things to explore those things with kids. Um, but really take that, that stance of an inquirer yourself. Um, if you're noticing in your child's writing, for example, um, that they're misspelling words, you might pull that out and investigate with that with them. Um, you could also, you know, if you're noticing like punctuation is a big one or parents often note like capitalization, um, you might take time with your child to explore some language that's correct in a book that you're reading together and have them notice like, why do we use periods or full stops at the end of a sentence? Why does that add meaning for us as readers? Could we also do that as writers? Um, you know, for capitalization, why do we capitalize letters? Investigate that with your child. Um, because as soon as they start to add meaning to it and make sense of it, that's when they start to transfer it into their own learning. Um, so kind of that idea of like, we're not doing these things or teaching these things in isolation. Um, words are spelled a certain way in English because it tells us something about what they mean. You know, we use punctuation um, and conventions and language because it adds meaning to our writing. So really taking that stance yourself as an inquirer and an investigator um, and helping your kids to kind of become problem, problem, solving, um, problem solvers in that way with language. And that will really mirror what we're doing in the classroom. Is there another question? Uh -huh. Okay. I'll pass it to me. <laughs> Hi. Um, so we've had a question here about um, moving a child from manipulatives through into that transferring stage. Um, with any of this, it's a really good question. And I'd say the first port of call would always be your child's teacher. And they know so much more about the exact specifics of where your child is at. Um, but in the classroom, what we do if we're moving child, it's a big jump, moving them from the manipulatives to the equations, is that we do a lot of time looking at the manipulatives and how we can move that into one of those visual models. So if it's base 10 blocks, how can we put those in a visual model and then from the visual model to the equation? So there's a lot of work kind of dipping in between those three things. Um, it's hard to answer that without the specifics. Um, it does change whether a child is working within addition, multiplication, with geometry, or what grade level there is. Um, but if I could be of more help answering that one-to-one, -one, please do feel free to email me and I can help give more information about that. Um, as well as that, reach out to your child's teacher. 
but we do spend a lot of time kind of bouncing in between manipulatives, visual models, equations, and back again. And a couple of more, a couple more. I'm going to pass to Molly. <laughs> the questions are coming in now. Okay, so this question is about um, paper-based practice book. So um, is there a paper-based practice book that I can work on with my child for math and language arts? So I'll speak to language arts and then I'll have Leanne answer for math. Um, so as I mentioned before, we don't have workbooks here at school. Um, um, and it's, it really goes back to like, sometimes when we're doing those things in isolation, we don't see transfer, you know? So there's a lot of research, you know, we know a lot of things about how kids learn to read and write and how kids kind of acquire that foundational literacy. Um, and the hardest part for kids is to learn something here, learn a new skill, and then actually transfer that into their own life as a reader and as a writer. Um, so we don't, we don't take that approach. Um, sometimes like I just, it's important to note when we're thinking of like grammar and conventions or spelling, a lot of those workbooks have this um, approach of correcting language, but kids sometimes don't have enough knowledge of the correctness of language to find errors. So, and that's where we kind of get in that situation where we're like, oh, we can do it in this workbook, but then we don't actually see kids doing it in their own writing or noticing those things as they're reading. Um, so that's kind of our approach here is we're constantly trying to put it in context and help kids to transfer those skills. And we would encourage you to do the same thing at home. Um, it's not saying you couldn't do some of those things. Some kids do well um, with practicing skills and then transferring. Um, it's just that, we see more growth and more progress when we're doing it within context. So I'll have Leanne just speak to that um, practice book in math. Hi. Um, so similarly, we, we don't have um, specific math practice books, but we do have those checklists. Um, so if you're looking at a place to start, perhaps to help your children at home, do go on to those overviews, have a look at the specific things that your child is focusing in, on, in class, and there may be some kind of ways to help there. Also reach out to your child's teacher. Um, the checklists are a great place to start and talk to your kids. What have you been learning about today? Um, what specifics have we got? Um, another tool that we do have to help practice at home is we have the IXL logins that come in. I know for language arts, we have the, the RAS kids. Um, so that, that is another tool that can help with that fluency and that mileage. Um, so IXL, I think we also have Math 300 in some grade levels. Um, so I hope that's kind of answered the majority of the questions. We really thank you for, for giving up your time today to come and listen to us talk. Um, if there have been some questions, sorry, that we did not quite get to, we will try and put some information out. The recording will be available um, and that will be sent out um, through Seesaw, I think, or on newsletters. Um, but thanks very much for attending. If you do have any further questions about any of this today, just reach out to Molly and I, and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your week. <laughs>